In any event, every effort will be made to reach Stalingrad itself, or at least to bring the city under fire from heavy artillery so that it may no longer be of any use as an industrial or communications center. Führer Directive 41 in the original plan for Case Blue. With the Soviets reeling after Kharkov, the Case Blue plan seemed like a perfect way to shatter the rest of the Red Army in the south and to capture the vital strategic oil fields in the Caucasus. Consisting of three phases, this plan asked quite a lot of the German Army Group South. For Phase 1, the 4th Panzer Army and Army Group Vikes were to form a northern pincer attack and meet Paulus's 6th Army at Voronezh, encircling the Soviets and forming the flank for Phase 2 of the attack. With Vike's 2nd Army in place, Phase 2 of Fallblau called for the newly freed 4th Panzer Army and Paulus's 6th Army to wheel southeastward, down the Don River and towards the Volga and Stalingrad. Meeting the 1st Panzer Army was to destroy the Soviet southwestern front and to either take Stalingrad or to at least use artillery to sever the Volga and stop the supply of oil and industrial materials north to the rest of the USSR. The final phase called for the Panzers to then go south and strike towards the main objective, the oil fields at Grozny, Baku, and Mykol. Under the original plan, these phases would proceed chronologically, with Stalingrad falling or being subdued before the attack on the Caucasus. This plan was also a lot to ask of Army Group South. Operation Barbarossa the previous summer operated on the assumption that the Wehrmacht required one Army Group per strategic axis of advance. Army Group North towards Leningrad, Army Group Center towards Moscow, and Army Group South towards Ukraine. While the Germans used the name Army Group Vikes and Hitler eventually split Army Group South into Army Groups A and B, the fact is that it was still a lot of the forces for one Army Group, but it was asked to attack three strategic axes of advance. Eastward towards Voronezh, southeastward towards Stalingrad, and then south towards the Caucasus. The length of the front in doing these attacks would create logistical issues similar to what the Germans faced with Barbarossa. Not only that, but to defend the long flank between Voronezh down to the Caucasus, the Germans would have to increasingly rely on their under-equipped allies to hold the front. While Kharkov had put them in a good position, Army Group South had quite the tall order in front of them. Ball Blue Phase 1, the drive on Voronezh. Just after dawn on June 28, 1942, Holt and Vikes launched a 30-minute artillery bombardment on Soviet positions. The Luftwaffe strafed and bombed in support, already reducing the efficiency of Soviet counterfire. Holt and Vikes sent their armor forward by 10 a.m., with the Soviets surprised by having 34 divisions attack so strongly at a target other than Moscow. Two Panzer Corps formed the vanguard of the Northern Pincer. Langermann's 24th and Kempf's 48th attacked the gap between the Soviet 13th and 40th armies, turning their flanks and threatening the 40th army with encirclement. 40th army had only 70 tanks to hold off Fike's 700 panzers. Pavelkin's 16th tank corps could provide support, but only had 180 tanks in their command. For the Southern Pincer, Paulus's 6th Army was led by General Stuma's 40th Panzer Corps with three infantry corps in assistance. Like the Northern Pincer, Paulus wanted to strike at the junction between Soviet armies and turn their flanks. The 21st Army fielded an impressive nine rifle divisions with tank support, including the 13th Tank Corps. The other army at the junction, Rabashev's 28th Army, had only five divisions. 90 tanks and three brigades assisted. The 23rd Tank Corps was there to help out, and both armies could ask the 4th and 24th Tank Corps from the front's reserve to help as well. On the first day, the Northern Pincer had immediate success. Langermann's Panzers advanced 10 kilometers after crossing the Tim River. They crumpled the 15th Rifle Division, causing the 13th Army to peel to the northeast, opening the way around 40th Army's flank. 25 kilometers to the south, Kemp's Pincer pushed back the 160th and 212th Rifle Divisions from 40th Army. This allowed the Panzers to advance 16 kilometers, with 24th Panzer's lead Kampfgruppen to capture a rail bridge over the Tim River. 
40th Army requested tank support from the Southwestern Front's commander, Golikov. Stavka agreed to have the 4th and 24th Tank Corps strike towards Staryi Oskol in an attempt to stop Vikes and Langerman. 17th Tank Corps was thrown in to attack Langerman from the north, and the 4 fighter and 3 assault air units were given as well. 16th Tank Corps went along to plug the northern gap. Command and control woes still plagued the Red Army at this point in 1942. Soviet documents after the battle revealed that 40th Army's commander and staff exhibited impermissible lack of concern in the Army's sector for such an alarming and harrowing situation. Neither the Army commander or his deputies were in the right-wing divisions to organize the fighting personally or to refine missions for the next day. Instead, they continued to command by telegraph or telephone. The weather did assist the Soviets by delaying Paulus' ability to launch Stuma in the southern pincer. To the north, things continued to unfold in favor of the Germans. On the 29th, Langermann's panzers were already at the Kashen River, meeting the second echelon formations of the 40th Army. This was a distance of 25 to 30 kilometers, and the Soviet 121st Rifle Division was more or less shattered by this point. South of this thrust, Kempf advanced 30 kilometers and crossed his sector of the Kashen River as well. 40th Army's headquarters was overrun, and the officers left documents, radios, maps, and other equipment in their haste to escape. This advance was so quick that it actually led to a friendly fire incident. Hornlein's Gross Deutschland Division was mistakenly bombed by the Luftwaffe because they couldn't believe a German division had advanced so far, and so the planes disregarded the recognition panels. The 13th Army was holding south of Livni and peeled back rather than being encircled. In addition, the parts of the 40th Army facing the 2nd Hungarians had yet to relent and fall back. Those brave divisions would soon be encircled if they did not retreat, however. The Soviets launched their counterstroke on the northern pincer. With all of the tank corps flooding in from different directions, they hoped to blunt Langermann's attack. Once again, though, the attack was not smoothly controlled. The attack axes were not refined on the ground, and an artillery preparation was not organized. Reflecting on the Stalingrad campaign, 62nd Army Staff Officer Anatoly Moreshko echoed these sentiments. Our counterattacks were hopeless. We would be told to attack after 50 minutes of shelling and an airstrike, but there wouldn't be any shelling, and no matter how long we waited, our aviation never appeared. A red flare rocket would go up, the signal for attack, but there had been no preparation and the enemy positions would be completely intact. We would fix bayonets, run 300 meters, then the Germans would open fire with everything they had got and we would be forced back to our starting positions. We felt such desperation and anger. We were so disorganized. Time and again we wondered of our high command, why don't they help us fight the enemy properly? In June and July of 1942, tank attacks were also disorganized. An NKVD report from July noted, Tank forces from the 23rd Brigade commenced their assault without any information on the number of enemy opposing them and lacking any effective interaction with infantry, artillery, and aviation. As a result, our tanks were easily ambushed and subjected to heavy artillery fire and attacks from the air. Our formations were completely broken up. Meanwhile, the enemy kept advancing. The 17th Tank Corps in particular proved exceedingly useless as it had, quote, lost its combat service support elements on the march from Voronezh and therefore was not supplied with fuel, end quote. Golikov requested that Stalin allow him to pull 40th Army back before its encirclement, but with no secondary defense positions prepared, Stalin told Golikov to organize a new counterattack. Stalin sent General Fedorenko of the Auto-Armored Directorate to try and fix the command and control issues. Stalin told Golikov, Remember well and truly, you now have more than 1,000 tanks, and the enemy does not have more than 500 tanks. Everything now depends on your skillful employment and precise command and control of these forces, understand? Despite this, the various brigades and corps still fought isolated and piecemeal battles, much as they had in 1941. On the 30th of June, the situation became critical for the Soviets. With rain letting up, Paulus now launched the Southern Pincer, spearheaded by Stuma and the 40th Panzer Corps. While the Panzers underperformed, elements of the 29th and 8th Infantry Corps reached the outskirts of Korocha, more than 20 kilometers into Soviet lines. Just like the Northern Pincer, this unhinged the junction of the 21st and 28th Armies. 
Not only were the 21st and 40th armies facing envelopment now, but Paulus alone had encircled the 301st and 227th Rifle Divisions, along with the 10th Tank Brigade. Ryabashev informed Timoshenko that he would set up a new line of defense along the Oskol River, but with the 28th Army reeling backwards, it seemed as though the 21st and 40th Armies would be left to their fates. In the northern sector on June 30th, Soviet resistance was stiffening to the north and east, but Kemp continued driving against Stary Oskol and was now only 28 kilometers away. Soviet armored counterattacks continued again and again, but they were unable to stop the advancing Germans. The 17th Tank Corps, now supplied with fuel, maneuvered around for two days without engaging, until they lost control and the units scattered after fighting near Gorsh Chechnya. The 17th Tank Commander, Fakleknikov, was immediately relieved by Vasilevsky. Volokhov's tank units eventually retreated to the Don by the 5th of July, having done little more than conduct delaying actions to the Germans. On the 1st of July, Vikes and Paulus continued their efforts to link up at Staryi Oskol and then to push east and capture Voronezh. The 21st and 40th armies were nearly encircled, and Ryabashev's 28th army was barely holding on with support of the 23rd Tank Corps. This same day, Stavka finally called for the withdrawal of the 21st, 40th, and 28th armies to the Oskol River. This withdrawal was chaotic. Command and control meant that some units did not receive orders right away, with Danilov and Parsagov not retreating until the 2nd of July. These units often faced artillery and air attacks as they attempted to flee to the east. On the 3rd of July, Heinrichs' 16th Motorized Division linked up with Kampfruppen from Paulus's infantry, thus closing the ring. Stuma's armor hammered Ryabashev in the 28th Army, driving it further and further away from the now-trapped Soviet units. Though the 28th Army, with help from the 23rd Tank Corps, had avoided being partially trapped, the fighting had cost them half of their men and even more tanks and heavy equipment. Timoshenko ordered Moskalenko to send the 38th Army to move from Ryabashev's left flank to reinforce the gap, but with the 40th and 21st Armies trapped, the Soviets had little hope for plugging the hole. As many as half of the 40th Army's men were able to slip away east of the Don by the 5th of July, though this was usually without heavy equipment and in small bands that did not resemble an organized fighting unit. The 21st Army, unable to counterattack to the east, less than half of their men were able to slip the encirclement in small groups, leaving behind their equipment as well. With the encirclement, the weakened 28th Army was tasked with holding the gap at the split between the southwestern and Bryansk fronts. Stalin was alarmed because if the Germans took the railroads at Voronezh, then this theater would be harder to reinforce with units from around Moscow in the center of the USSR. The 3rd and 6th reserve armies would try to hold Voronezh, and the 5th and 7th armies would try to help at the gap between the fronts and prevent the Germans from following the Don River down towards Stalingrad. By the 4th of July, Stalin and the Soviets had accepted that the Don River would be the new defensive line. Vikes was already sending Langerman and Kempf to slice around Kestornoye and cross the Olym River. While the Soviet 284th Rifle Division was bravely defending the city of Kestornoye itself, it had to withdraw in order to avoid being cut off by Vikes' panzers. Voronezh was defended by fortified regions, the leftovers of the 40th Army, which just underwent an officer change courtesy of Stalin, and some NKVD security units. The city itself just didn't have the forces to contain the Germans. On July 4th, the 1st Regiment of the Gross Deutschland Motorized Division was able to use machine guns and take a road bridge over the Don River, just 9 kilometers west of Voronezh, breaching the last major obstacle to the city. Two days later, on the 6th of July, the city was taken with little resistance. 75 kilometers to the south, Paulus and the 6th Army swung northeastern to once again try and encircle the Soviets using the Don River this time. Weather thwarted this meeting, but what was left of the 21st and 40th Armies retreated east of the Don with what little strength they had left. During the German advance into Voronezh, Stalin ordered the 5th Tank Army to counterattack from the north and attempt to stop the disaster. By July 5th, Stalin had been pouring men into Golikov's Bryansk front, which now had 23 rifle divisions and 16 tank brigades with over a thousand tanks. These July operations were no more successful than their earlier counterstrokes. Golikov had trouble controlling his forces and did not have sufficient radio contact, and then had to move his headquarters when the Germans took Voronezh on the 6th. 
With the tank brigades still forming up in their assembly areas, rather than waiting until they were ready, they attacked brigade after brigade in a piecemeal fashion. By the 8th of July, the Soviets had forced some of Langermann's panzers back by up to 6 kilometers in some places, but German air superiority and mechanical failures of Soviet tanks in marshy terrain made it hard for them to advance. Artilleryman Mikhail Borisov described the air discrepancy, saying, Above us were six of our I-16s. These aircraft were ponderous and slow. The troops called them donkeys. Suddenly one German Messerschmitt appeared. We watched the combat above, but it proved to be a very short fight. The German plane shot them down, one by one. We were all at his mercy, for there was nowhere to take cover. I remember shaking my fist at that departing plane and thinking, we cannot fight like this. Red Army clerk Kolesnikov stated that, The German army is far smarter and more capable than ours. Look at their equipment, and what do we have? A few ancient aeroplanes. The newspapers say we are holding the Germans, but it's not so. Our press is lying to us. Stalin noted the chaos and lack of command and control and split the Bryansk front in order to make it easier to control on the 7th of July. Golikov was given the new Voronezh front to try and push the Germans back across the Don River, while the new Bryansk front continued to attack south and try and break off the German armored spearheads. Vasilevsky continued the trend of Soviet micromanaging and ordered the 5th Tank Army to stop frontal assaults on Langerman and to try and bypass and encircle the panzers. This was partially based on faulty intelligence, with the Soviets believing they were only facing one panzer division. Instead, the Germans, with the aid of the Luftwaffe, struck into the teeth of the Soviet counterstroke on the 9th and 10th of July, greatly damaging three Soviet tank corps and halting the Soviet progress. The Soviets tried again on the 11th of July, but the 5th Tank Army was at under 50% of its armored strength and was losing the Battle of Attrition. Bringing in the 340th Infantry Division for support, Langermann launched a counterattack on the weakened Soviet armor on the 12th of July and forced the Soviets to retreat before they were outflanked. As the fighting subsided on the 15th of July, the final toll on the 5th Tank Army was 7,929 men and half of its tanks. They claimed to have killed nearly 19,000 Germans and destroyed over 300 German tanks, but these numbers are most likely inflated. The Soviet attempt to retake Voronezh itself from the east, though not as fierce, was similarly unsuccessful. The Soviets lost two brigades of tanks between the 5th and 8th of July when the Germans cut them off near Voronezh. To the east of the city, Golikov was able to advance up to 8 kilometers in the face of heavy German artillery and air power. Soviet commanders were too far back to rapidly respond to changes in battlefield conditions, and many used written communications instead of radio. By the 15th, the Voronezh counterattacks were also called off. Phase 1 of Fall Blau ended in complete success for the Germans. They had encircled the better part of two Soviet armies, smashed multiple infantry and tank armies, and captured Voronezh, all while repelling Soviet counterattacks. Despite this, Hitler was already growing restless. On July 3rd, he told Feder von Bock to not get bogged down in Voronezh, but rather to start Phase 2 of Fall Blau early, even though the Panzers were not in position yet. The German doctrine, or Auftragstaktik, generally gives German officers latitude to act on their own initiative. As such, Bach wanted to retain 4th Panzer Army to fully secure the rail and road lines in and around Voronezh before pushing southeast towards Stalingrad. Bach was also skeptical about plans to give the 1st Panzer Army to list new Army Group A when Army Group South was to be split. Bach thought it would be too early to send the Panzers toward the Caucasus and would hurt the drive on Stalingrad. Despite his reservations, on July 7th, the split occurred. Bach would now have the 4th Panzer Army, 6th Army, 2nd Army, and the Hungarian 2nd Army. List in the new Army Group A was given the 1st Panzer Army along with the 11th and 17th Armies. With the Soviet counterattacks developing around Voronezh, Bach was even more concerned about defending this widening flank as he pushed towards Stalingrad in Fallblau Phase 2. Halder and the OKH disagreed, with Halder writing, I cannot see any such threat. There are just some isolated armor units of the enemy which, in their desperation, attack in every direction, but do not constitute any operational threat. Von Bach has become completely dependent on Holt's initiative, and so has oriented the offensive towards Voronezh to a greater degree than he could justify. 
While this first phase was a success for the Germans, military historian David Glantz points out that there are three generalizations that are in need of correcting when examining phase one of Fall Blau. The first point he stresses is that while the Soviets did have a manpower parity to the Germans, and more than double the amount of armor that the Germans had, their downfall was logistics and command and control issues. The second is that although the initial encirclement of the 21st and 40th armies was somewhat easy for the Germans, the fighting around Voronezh shows that this campaign was far bloodier than previous historical sources thought. The Soviets were launching large-scale armored counterattacks and forcing the Germans to retain armor in the Voronezh area longer than they would have liked, in addition to blunting some of the panzer strength through the fighting. In general, Phase 1 of Fall Blau is bloodier than previous historical sources thought. Finally, one misconception that was written about earlier was that Stalin did not withdraw his men in the face of German encirclements. While men at lower levels would flee and try to avoid encirclement, Stalin continued to put reserve armies into gaps and to try and blunt the German armor with Soviet tank armies. The main point of this is that even this phase one was far more important than a lot of previous sources give it credit for. Next time on Stalingrad, the city that ground on the Wehrmacht, we will examine phase two of Fall Blau and the approach to Stalingrad with episode three, the retreat across the Donbass. As always, stay excited about history.